I want to thank our opening speakers and welcome our keynote speakers, who I would like to invite to the bench as I call you, uh, call you out. <laughs> it is my pleasure first to welcome Ambassador Christian Vandewasser. I met Christian in New York in 2002. He remains the permanent representative of Liechtenstein to the UN and a fixture of the ICC community in New York. His work in many working groups and committees has furthered the discussion on Security Council and UN reform, and his institutional memory of the process that created the ICC is critical for us today. Can you please take your seat? Thank you. I would like to welcome Luis Moreno Ocampo, who served as the first prosecutor of the ICC and who also played a crucial role in the 1985 Junta trial documented in the recent film, Argentina 1985. He has since turned to documenting this early period of the ICC's work in academic literature and on film. Can you please take your seat, Mr. Ocampo? I would like to wel welcome Fatou Ben Souda, the second prosecutor of the ICC, and current High Commissioner of the Gambia to the United Kingdom. Can you please take your seat? And finally, I welcome Bridget Inder, former Executive Director of the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice and a continuing civil society advocate. Please take your seat. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Jennifer. Um, it's, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, it's always a very special moment for me to be in this room, and I've been here more than once. And it's a real honor to, uh, to be able to address you uh, today. So thank you very much for um, inviting me today. And I want to thank the organizers for getting us together in in this format to reflect on the achievements and the uh, challenges of the, um, of the ICC. It, uh, <clears throat> there have been several moments for me where I felt that the pandemic was over and today moving over to, to, to uh, courtroom 600 was, was one of those. So it's really great to be, uh, to be together with uh, old friends um, again and to have an open conversation. Um, when we gathered in Rome in '98, we created a, a system of international criminal justice with the ICC at its center, but rooted in the ongoing interplay and cooperation with states. I think it is therefore very important that we take uh, a comprehensive look at the Rome system um, as a whole. And my remarks, in a way, I guess, naturally will. Uh, gravitate a bit towards what I think is our role as, um, as states. You know, I have been uh, both a, a strong supporter of the ICC, but I think also a critical voice of the court where I believed uh, it did not fully fulfill expectations. Um, but I do believe it's extremely important for us as states to look at ourselves and to look at our role uh, that is actually indispensable for the court to do its work. And that's why I first want to talk about independence. Independence was a key achievement at the Rome Conference, and I think it's worth remembering that it was a hard-fought success. The proprio motu power of the prosecutor, clearly an indispensable element of genuine independence, was met with strong opposition and only agreed too late in the negotiations. Some states even came into the Rome Conference with the position that the future International Criminal Court should only be able to exercise its jurisdiction on the basis of a referral from the Security Council, sort of a generic ICTY and ICTR model. Let's think for a moment where we would be today had that position prevailed. We would have a court in name only, a court that would be pretty much guaranteed to not have any new investigations for 
the foreseeable future. Well, fortunately, the statute says what it says today, and the proprio motu power has been at the origin of a number of investigations. On the other hand, that does not mean that independence is not an issue. Far from it, there are issues of uh, perception in light of decisions of the prosecutor's office that are just as important. The deprioritization in Afghanistan stands out in particular, but there have been others. For us, as supporters of the court, and perhaps for those of us who represent states in particular, this poses a dilemma. On the one hand, respect for the independence of the court, of course, implies respect for strategic and judicial decisions. But that does not mean that we have to agree, nor does it mean that we cannot voice our opinions. In fact, in our outreach to those who have not yet joined the Rome Statute, and also to those who are part of the system, but critical of it, and there are various among the state parties. We must engage on these questions because they are burning issues to some of our counterparts. And we can only have credibility if we make it clear that all relevant decisions are with the prosecutor, but also that we believe that all crimes must be looked at in light of the evidence, the gravity, and the other criteria that guide criminal investigations, irrespective of factors such as political affiliation and indeed political position. The second aspect in the conversation about, about independence is our collective response when independence is threatened and undermined, typically, though not always, by non-state parties, by states that have not joined the Rome Statute or have not done so yet. There have been very blatant examples of course, most prominently the sanctioning of senior officials of the court, including Fatou, sitting next to me, by the former U.S. administration, an unprecedented and hopefully standalone example of abuse of power. State parties did come together in support of the court in this emergency situation, but there have been numerous others, less brazen, certainly more subtle, perhaps, but not automatically less worrisome. And I believe that we as states have repeatedly failed to stand up for the court's independence in the manner that is necessary. And we are still lacking a robust mechanism that can be triggered to come in support of the court in these circumstances. The second aspect is complementarity in some of the opening speakers have mentioned it. Complementarity is an easy conversation only in so far as everybody thinks it's a key element of the Rome Statute. It certainly is. It places the primary responsibility for the investigation and prosecution of the most serious crimes on states themselves. This is both a recognition of state sovereignty and the vehicle to ease the workload of the court. Colombia is now regularly referred to as a successful model of complementarity because the preliminary, preliminary examination activities helped catalyze positive steps in the peace negotiations. But perhaps we are too quick to forget that the preliminary examination phase, which lasted more than a decade, led to much criticism of the court, and that perhaps the result was not one of strategic brilliance, but rather of changed circumstances on the ground, to which we all believe the court has contributed. But questions do remain, in particular in light also of the fact that the new approach of OTP to preliminary examinations would have led to a closure of this examination long before the more positive turn of events in Colombia. But the key challenge to complementarity in my view, lies elsewhere. The Rome Statute has in no uncertain terms defined unable or unwilling, as we all know, as the complementarity test. Some states and some state parties now seem to want to reinterpret this standard. 
and to limit it to the aspect of inability only. In other words, where a state party has a functioning judicial system, which concludes that a state does not need to be, does it, that a case does not need to be pursued, this is the final word. It is obvious what that would result in. The irreversible perception that the court is to prosecute only crimes committed in countries that have capacity challenges or are failed states in the extreme in order to defend the court to secure its success from all corners of the globe. I believe we have to stand up very strongly for the philosophy of complementarity as it is written in the Rome Statute. And that alone leads to the conclusion that indeed nobody is above the law. Let me also offer some reflections on the treaty beyond that. The first thing is to say that it is a very strong treaty. In hindsight, of course, we know that the moment to negotiate and adopt the Rome Statute could not possibly have been better. That today, we would likely have difficulty to even get a negotiation off the ground, let alone to obtain the outcome that the statute today represents. Many people in this room were in Rome, and I think we all remember that there was always a sense of historic opportunity at the Rome Conference. And I think in hindsight, we can say we were right in seizing that historic opportunity. The Rome Statute is without any doubt one of the, if not the highlight of treaty making in the last decades. That in itself would be enough reason to stand up for it. That should be very easy to agree on, at least for the people in this room. But there's also the question of where we should take the treaty. Must it be frozen in time, reflecting the status of international law at the end of the 90s? Or should it be a living document that reflects the progressive development of international law? The expectations of the public vis-a-vis -vis the International Criminal Court are high. The court officials assembled here know this much better than I do. Often they are too high. And it is our job as public servants, I think it's also a job of civil society to manage these expectations, to keep explaining the basics of the Rome Statute to the wider public, and let's face it, that includes our policymakers, our own policymakers. But there's certainly a risk that the court can be considered less important by those who are placing high hope in international criminal justice if our attitude is to shut the door to changes and to insist that the court's jurisdiction must, for all eternity, be limited to the four core crimes currently contained in it. Defending the integrity of the statute is certainly a collective obligation we have, especially with respect to the existing provisions but it would also be a mistake to indicate rejection of all suggestions for change in particular, where they would increase the court's relevance. One glaring challenge that the treaty poses today is its limited jurisdictional reach with respect to the crime of aggression. Better than anyone, of course, I know the history of the consensus reached in Kampala and the discussions that took place in the aftermath, especially in the lead up to the activation decision in 2017. When the Rome Statute was adopted, the inclusion of the crime of aggression was due to the persistence of some key figures at the conference. Few expected at that time that actual exercise of jurisdiction by the ICC would ever happen. The argument that aggression was a thing of the past, that war was in essence an interstate affair and the court didn't need jurisdiction over it was persuasive to many 
and remained so during the Kampala negotiations even, and when states decided to activate jurisdiction while people started voicing that opinion less and less so publicly. Today, the world is a different place than we had hoped. In 98, the term aggression itself, which was shunned in the diplomatic vernacular consistently for so many years, is now part and parcel not just of briefing material and speeches, but of UN resolutions. The most recent one adopted yesterday, and it was mentioned by a previous speaker with an overwhelming majority in the General Assembly, a very, very important decision um, that the United Nations GA took yesterday. It has been incredibly disappointing for so many people to find out that the ICC cannot prosecute the aggression committed against Ukraine and called that by an overwhelming majority of the international community. And that this is so, even though the ICC does have technically jurisdiction over this crime, except where it should. Given where we are today, we should take the obvious step to bring the court's jurisdiction over this crime in line with that of the other crimes. Aggression is not a hypothetical crime. The illegal use of force is the most fundamental attack on the international order, as well as the source of so many other crimes the court has jurisdiction over. And it is the crime of aggression alone that guarantees that the political and military leaders who bear the brunt of the responsibility are brought to justice. And this alone fulfills the purpose of the Rome Statute, which, and I'm going to read from the preamble, reaffirms the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, and in particular that all states shall refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of the state." End of quote. Quote from the Rome Statute. How can you explain that the ICC cannot prosecute the aggression against Ukraine and that it is the most relevant international judicial body that we have? If the pursuit of international justice for the most serious crimes is to succeed, I strongly believe that we have to create an alternative avenue to ensure that the crime of aggression against Ukraine is prosecuted. This will, in fact, enhance the relevance of the ICC and of its future work, far from taking anything away from it or from its own investigations on Ukraine. If, on the other hand, this act of aggression, the most brazen that we have witnessed since the creation of the United Nations, which doesn't mean it was the only one, and the one that was determined to be that by the very body itself, the General Assembly, that has defined what an act of aggression is in the first place. If this act of aggression goes unpunished, the message for the future will be devastatingly clear. There is no accountability for this crime, not before the ICC and not anywhere. Thus, it is in our hands to prevent this from happening, and I believe it is our duty to do so if we are genuinely committed to international criminal justice. I thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Klaus Ragwitz, in absence, Jennifer Schenz at present, and the International Academy at Nuremberg, for inviting all of us to be at this historic place, called Room 600. It helped us to understand the big picture, as Christian Benavese was explaining to us. In May 1945, the war ended in Europe, 
the UN in June, the UN Charter was adopted, establishing a permanent forum for diplomatic negotiations. And two months later, in August 45, the Nuremberg Charter was adopted. And that is a huge change because the decision was different than the UN Charter. Instead of executing enemies, those responsible for violence abroad could be prosecuted. That is new, it's different. And in fact, that moment is when international criminal justice was born here in this courtroom. Nuremberg prosecutor Robert Jackson provided a rationale. He said, and that's connected with Ambassador Abbas's say, the only answer in the past to recalcitrance was impotence or war. And that is the situation today with Ukraine. And Jackson said, only sanctions which rich individuals can peacefully and effectively be enforced. In fact, it's a very pragmatic tool, law. Nazi leaders were not treated as enemies. They were seated there in this courtroom facing criminal charges. On the bench, a panel of judges represented an international community for the first time in history. Here is where international criminal justice was born. Going for Jackson, the trial represents the practical effort to utilize international law to meet the greatest menace of our time, aggressive, aggressive war. And in fact, the court agreed with him. The judges ruled that aggression is a supreme international crime containing within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. And since July 2002, after enormous diplomatic efforts, the Rome Statute transformed the Nuremberg legacy into a permanent system to face international crimes. But a month later, in August 2002, the American Service Member Protection Act was adopted, prohibiting US cooperation with the ICC. And in March 2003, another aggressive war started, this time in Iraq. There is no chaos, there is no harmony, just complexity. I was appointed as the first chief prosecutor in April 2003. And for the last 10 years, I was reflecting about my, my practice and the innovative legal architecture of the Rome Statute. In November, a book will be published summarizing my observations, but let me share some thoughts here. I took office in the middle of the Iraq war. In those days, there were serious doubts about the viability of the institution. But in those days, Iraq, paradoxically, the Iraq military intervention galvanized state parties' diplomatic support for the Rome Statute. State confronted the Bush administration's efforts to undermine the ICC. Furthermore, in 2005, France led another 80 parties of the Rome Statute at the UN Security Council to refer the Darfur situation to the ICC. Reluctantly, the Bush administration had to accept a relationship with the ICC. Moreover, in February 2011, the UN Security Council referred Libya to the ICC by consensus. Remember, US, China, Russia, India, all of them vote in favor of the referral. And on those months, in, uh, in March, the Council 
at the request of the regional group, ECOWAS, authorized to use military forces in Ivory Coast, integrating diplomatic and military efforts with the International Criminal Court. So in those days, the three concepts were working together. Since then, the ICC is part of the international institutional landscape. Its existence not longer at risk. But that moment in 2011 was at the same time the peak and the end of a cohesive diplomatic support for international justice. The Syrian conflict divided the international community in 2012. And since then, the three models to manage international violence, war, diplomacy, and international justice are in conflict. And that is, for me, the issue we have to understand. It's not so much about the ICC. It's about the rest, the problem. In 22, the Rome status is operating again in the, middle, in the middle of a new aggressive war. The Ukrainian conflict triggered political support for the ICC, but also for the war. As mentioned before, 43 state parties refer the Ukrainian situation to the ICC, and Chief Prosecutor Karin Khan is very active, leading justice effort. But as a matter of law, Chief Prosecutor Khan cannot investigate the most obvious crime committed by President Putin, aggression crime. The new Article 15 of the Rome Statute requires that the aggressor should be also a state party. It's a failure by design. It's a failure by design. And it's a very costly hypocrisy, I would say, or diplomatic ambiguity, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a very costly diplomatic ambiguity. I'm sorry. I'm not a diplomat. If states are serious about ending the impunity of aggression crime, they must change the rules. As Jackson predicted, we are now between frustration and war. And worse, the Ukraine conflict is promoting support for war. The world order is in disarray. And let me be clear about the urgency. Without a global legal order, humanity is going back to tribalism. And let me be clear about the risk. In the 21st century, fighting tribes will be equipped with nuclear and cyber weapons. It's not a joke. We are facing a huge problem. And that's why this meeting is so important. Peaceful countries like Germany and Sweden are now planning for a permanent state of war and spending billions in military equipment. And I see a big change because I remember in 2011, Germany fully supported the Libya referral to the ICC, but it abstained on the UN Security Council vote authorizing to use military force in Libya. Now, Germany changed, and US experts celebrate the change, and in fact, urged Germany to expand its defense budget. Diplomatic support for international justice is affected by the diplomatic support required by a war. That's a problem. But still, it's a perfect time to assess the Rome Statute activities, to study the unprecedented legal architecture and keep innovating on international institutions. In the 21st century, we celebrate innovations on technology and we dismiss innovations on institutional design. The U.S. celebrate the Founding Fathers, those who wrote the U.S. constitutions. Delegates at Rome, and Christian Juan, Silvio Fernandez, the others, are our founding mothers and fathers. They fulfill an impossible task. In just five weeks, they adopted a new global code and transformed 
transformed a global order based on diplomatic relations between sovereign states. It's important to remain this, to remain the design. The Rome Statute created more than a court. It produces a peculiar confederation of nations committing to ending impunity for the most serious crimes, and thus contributing to their preventions. Nations harmonize the standards, and this is the disruptive novelty, they authorize an independent and non-state actor, the prosecutor, to trigger the IC intervention if they fail to act. That's a system. So, as the first chief prosecutor, I need to understand the system and respect my legal mandate. To achieve that goal, my first activity was a public hearing at the Peace Palace Annex, discussing our draft policies with experts from all over the world, many of them here. The idea received defined our unprecedented role during the preliminary examination, the most innovative aspect of my job. Let me summarize the policies. A, we developed the concept of positive complementarity. B, the selection of the, gra the gravest situations. C, the policy to focus investigation in those most responsible. D, such a policy allow us to present inactivity as the criterion to establish the court jurisdiction without analyzing inability or unwillingness. E, the invitation to states to refer situation before using our proper motor authority to facilitate our activities during the investigation. F, a policy differentiating the interest of justice from the interest of peace, a UN Security Council responsibility. And G, to inform in advance the UN Security Council of our decision to request arrest warrants in Darfur and Libya, allowing the Council to exercise its Article 16 authority to suspend our investigation. Following such policy and showing the geographical and Rome status impact, we opened investigation in 17, sorry, we opened preliminary examination in 17 different situations, two in Asia, one in the Middle East, one between in the coast road of Western Asia and Eastern Europe at Georgia, two in Africa, one in Central America, two in South America, and one in Europe, around the world. We opened investigation in 40 parties. Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, they, ref they accept our invitation and refer the situation. Central African Republic was, invite was invited by a, a NGO, FIDH, and we used our Pokemon to power in Kenya. There was no problem. In fact, I announced our promoter decision in Kenya, supported by the President and Prime Minister of Kenya. So all the problems of Prokemoto in Rome were dissipated. Uh, then a non party, Ivory Coast, accepted this intervention, and the court worked as an ad hoc tribunal at the request of the Council in Darfur and Libya. So all the positive decision of the prosecution to start investigations were reviewed and confirmed by the chambers. The fears of a frivolous prosecutor or an ever-expanding international criminal court were not confirmed. But the ICC operation in the proper jurisdiction created new challenges. We had to investigate ongoing, conf ongoing conflicts and security became a big problem for us. Supported by state parties and non parties who obtained the evidence and we request overall in my time 31 are required on someone to appear. All of them, in, in, again, the top leaders following our policy, including Joseph Kony, a militia leader, and head of state as Omar al-Bashir, Muammar Gaddafi, and Lorraine Gagbo. The Petra Chamber reviewed the evidence and issued all of them. During my tenure, we, I the office participated in seven confirmation charges and three trials. Tomas Lubanga was convicted, highlighting the suffering of child soldiers and the additional torments against girl soldiers. Girl soldiers was in addition as killing as a boy soldier, they had to cook and they had to be sex slaves. And we highlighted that in the first case. The chamber rulings on the individual responsibility of the defendants are the most visible ICD action. They could reverberate in state parties and beyond. Still, and it's important to remember that, the chambers are just nodes of a network 
integrated by states and different independent organs of the court. Each node could be evaluated, but to end impunity, the entire system must perform in accordance with the complementarity model. Taking into consideration the innovative legal architecture created by the Rome Statute, in June 2003, during my training, I proposed an evaluation model that Bill Pace opposed. The effectiveness of the International Criminal Court should not be measured by the number of cases that reach it. On the contrary, on the contrary, complementarity implies that the absence of trials before this court, as a consequence of the regular functioning of national institutions, will be a major success. Zero case could be great. Depend. The point is, the relevance of the prosecutor's decisions and the court ruling to prevent massive crimes depends on decisions adopted by other actors. That's the peculiarity of our institutions. We depend on national decisions to implement our, our decisions. And interesting, the court intervention issued a red warrant <coughs> played a crucial role to stop massive atrocities in Uganda and Ivory Coast. Even before the, before the conviction, even in Ivory Coast, there were no conviction, conviction. But it did not transform the situation in other situations. Our negative decision in, on Palestine in 2012 promoted a UN General Assembly recognition of Palestine statehood and later its acceptance as a state party. Colombia became the best example of the policy of positive complementarity, prosecuting thousands of perpetrators and demobilizing militias still respecting the Rome Statute. I am proud of the 10 years, my nine years of Colombia preliminary examination. It was not a mistake, it was the right thing to do. And in fact, we had an incredible impact. And also was legal. <sighs> Let me finish with that. The compliance with arrest warrant issued by the court during the first nine years depend on legal commitments. The rate of fugitives from the ICC in the situation referred by the Council is, at this moment, 62.5%. There are five fugitives in eight cases. In eight cases. Instead, cases for the treaty jurisdictions, the rate is 5.5. So the difference is 62.5 against 5.5. The only fugitive of 18 cases in the treaty jurisdiction is Joseph Coney. That's it. One in 18 and five in eight. So the state party is committed to arrest. Security Council provides no obligation to arrest. And that's the difference. Let me conclude. War proposed to kill enemies abroad. Instead, the Rome Statute is treating perpetrators of massive crimes as individuals with rights. They could be criminals, but they are no enemies. The problem is aggressive wars are still normal. So we need to end Ukraine, Ukrainian war, but also we need to end Syrian war. We need to stop all the wars, stop the war as a separate mechanism to solve conflicts. We need experts to propose new mechanisms to manage conflict, and you are the expert required. But we also need political leaders supporting peace and justice, not leaders supporting war. That's what is missing. The most important defendant at Nuremberg, Hermann Goering, explaining how easy it is for national leaders to obtain popular support for war. He said, all you have to do is tell people that they are being attacked and denounce the pacifist for lack of patriotism. The Nazi top leaders rightly say it was the same way in any country, I, in any time. But so to transform the leader's position, we need people support for justice. People will transform the political leaders' incentives. But people don't read, don't read judicial decisions. To read them, we need art, songs, movies. Those arts connect people and justice with emotions. Let me, you, let me give you a personal example that Jennifer mentioned. Two weeks ago, Amazon premiered a, fe a featured film called Argentina 1985, presenting 
the work of the prosecutors in the trials against the military junta in my country. Since then, the entire country is discussing what happened 38, 38 years ago. Even the president of the country went to a theater to watch the movie with the high school students. So we need, move it, we need movies and art about international justice to mobilize people. If there is a strong demand, leaders will support justice, and then the expert will implement the solution. Let me finish with that. Victory is not a world without violence. It is impossible to create a global or domestic community without conflicts. Success is to learn how to use new technologies to establish peaceful models to manage violence. Success is to learn how to use new technologies to establish peaceful models to manage violence. And failure is not to try. The battle for justice is endless, but the war should not be. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, honorable judges, your excellencies, um, uh, dear colleagues. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and indeed to share the panel with uh, Christian, Lewis, and uh, Bridget. Uh, but let me take this opportunity as well to thank the International Nuremberg Principles and my friend Klaus for kindly inviting me to address you on the work of the ICC and indeed on the achievements and the challenges faced during the term that I served as prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and whether the ultimate goal of the court has been clarified in relation to internal processes and the court's functions. For obvious reasons, I will focus my work uh, together with my team at the Office of the Prosecutor. What we have lived through in the past decade has been unique, and what the international community has managed to accomplish together was really tremendous. And I am sincerely humbled by the graciousness and kindness and support that has been extended to me by my colleagues and other members of the Rome Statute family and its supporters during my mandate. During the nine years of my term, we, as a court, have achieved much together and have overcome incredible challenges with courage, integrity, and resilience as an institution. We found strength and courage in the truth of our convictions and the righteousness of our cause. We found comfort and refuge in our solidarity and common purpose when placed under the most outrageous attempts at political interference and personal threats due to the court's legitimate judicial work. We overcame fear and threats with the force of our unity, humanity, and strict professionalism. In short, we overcame vice with virtue. Together, we, supported by the court states parties, members of civil society, and other ICC friends, have taken the court to the next level in the past decade, expanded its work and enhanced its relevance, its legitimacy, and credibility. Indeed, setbacks were encountered, but they were encountered with professional seriousness, managed, and lessons were learned all with a view and purpose to do things better and more effectively. Notwithstanding the realities of the political arena and the changing tides of politics, I truly believe that the court, as I left it, and the Rome Statute system are stronger and more relevant than they were a decade ago. And this is not to say everything was perfect and there was room for improvement. Of course there is room for improvement. There always will be but we have done much and much to be and have much to be proud of. 10 years ago, I was sworn in as the ICC's second prosecutor 
following a unanimous vote of confidence bestowed upon me by the Assembly of States Parties and the wider international community and the support of the Gambia and the African Union for my candidature. In 2012, when I was sworn into office, I had no illusions about the enormity of the task ahead. The job of the prosecutor is an incredibly complex and demanding one. With this mandate comes great responsibility, requiring focus, often self-sacrifice and fortitude. When I took office, I stated that justice, real justice, is not a pick and choose system. And that to be effective, to be just, and to be a real deterrent, the Office of the Prosecutor's activities and decisions must be based solely on the law and the evidence. We may operate in a political environment, but our work must be shielded and free from the winds and whims of politics when those strengths are not aligned with our collective obligations under the Rome Statute. During my tenure, I have done my utmost to live by these convictions in the service of the Rome Statute. I have strived throughout my term to honorably and with integrity discharge a complex multifaceted mandate with independence and impartiality. And I have made my decisions with careful deliberation, but without fear or favor, even in the face of adversity. Even at considerable personal cost, I have sought to focus not on the words and propaganda of a few influential individuals whose aim is to evade justice, but rather to listen to the millions of victims who look to the court as a beacon of hope, as the last bastion of justice and accountability for atrocity crimes, where the law, their protector, has otherwise fallen silent. And these are not empty words. Two weeks before I stepped down as prosecutor, I undertook a mission to Sudan and the Darfur region. In meeting with victims and affected communities, such as those at Kalma Camp, I was again able to see just how important our work, the work of the ICC, really is, and how much is riding on that promise, the promise of the ICC. Welcome, welcome ICC, the crowd enthusiastically chanted as we entered the camp. It was a stark reminder that justice matters, but that we must work together to deliver on that promise through effective collaboration and cooperation. We all have a role to play for the Rome Statute system to work as efficiently as possible. Let the resilience, the courage, and the quest for justice of the Darfurians be an inspiration to us all to redouble our efforts to advance a culture of accountability for atrocity crimes the world over. Providing justice and a sense of hope to those who seek the protection of the law for the harm they have suffered was the very inspiration behind my decision as a teenager to study law. And since then, it has informed every step of my professional career. It is with this same sense of duty and desire to make a difference for those most vulnerable that I decided to run in 2011 for the position of prosecutor after having served for eight years as the court's deputy prosecutor. And since assuming office as prosecutor, the changes we have undertaken at the office have been sweeping. We announced and quickly moved to take a number of initiatives concerning strategic direction, organizational management, and internal office culture. We adopted a new prosecutorial strategy and a major shift in how we investigate and build our cases. We enhanced our quality control mechanisms, we streamlined and strengthened our administrative procedures, improved transparency in how we conduct our work and make significant efforts to build a positive office culture, including by adopting a code of conduct for the office and instituting the core values of dedication, integrity, and respect. We have encouraged the establishment for a focal point for gender and saw it through. And we have instituted gender awareness training and have embarked on related initiatives which can only be built, up, built upon and strengthened. In short, we have strived to strengthen an office that is accountable at all levels, both in terms of performance and professional conduct. 
We have since secured important successes in court and issued important policy papers on the strategic priority we have set from sexual and gender-based crimes to the protection of cultural heritage. We have lived through these policies in practice. It is by no coincidence that I elevated the effective investigation and prosecution of sexual and gender-based crimes and crimes against children as strategic goals when I took office in 2012. The policy papers my office developed on these topics should be understood, not as mere pieces of writing on paper, but as seminal guiding documents, strengthening the consistent application of and protection offered by the Rome Statute framework to the victims of these heinous crimes. And this has been a defining feature of my tenure, during which we have attempted to give direction and meaning to important principles underpinning the Rome Statute and to explore the full potential of its provisions. It is by virtue of this approach that we found success in the court decisions, such as the ruling delivered in the Myanmar-Bangladesh situation, confirming the court's jurisdiction over the alleged deportation of Rohingya people, and also the appellate ruling and head of state immunity in the Al-Bashir case in the Darfur Sudan situation. It is through this approach that through the conviction of Mr. Boscon Taganda on all counts, including for the first time in the court's history for the crime of sexual slavery, as well as the crime of rape against women and men, we contributed to emerging jurisprudence by extending the protection under international humanitarian law to also cover crimes committed by an armed group against members of their own group. And just before I left office in 2021, we ob obtained an important conviction on the Ongwen case for the brutal and terrifying campaigns of attacks on the civilian population, sexual slavery, forced marriage and forced, forced pregnancy, murder, mutilation, torture, pillaging, abduction and other atrocities by the Lord's Resistance Army with Mr. Ongwen as one of its leaders, rendering accountability for the horrific consequences of his actions for the civilian population in Uganda, including for women and children. And in May of that year, last year, 2020, sorry, he was sentenced to 25 years of imprisonment. Moreover, through the case against Mr. Al-Mahdi, we sent a clear message that the intentional attacks against historic monuments and buildings dedicated to religion is a serious crime under international law. My office's policy on cultural heritage, which we issued in 2021, solidified this message. And I have been encouraged by the great interest and support received during the consultation phase of this policy by states and a variety of stakeholders and international actors, including our institutional partner, the United Nations Scientific and Cultural Organization. Cultural heritage constitutes a unique and important testimony of the culture that I, and identities of people and the degradation and destruction of culture, her, cultural heritage constitutes a great loss to those communities which are directly affected as well as the international community as a whole. And it is the repository of the human experience throughout the ages. To protect it, is to pay homage to the basic fabric of civilization and civilizational practice. We must therefore protect cultural heritage, and this policy ex equips us to stay committed to that necessary course. An important aim of the policy paper, like others before it, is to raise awareness about and seek collaborative efforts to address spe specific forms of prevailing criminality. Similarly, our recently finalized and published paper on situation completion is an important development that has served the office greatly by providing transparency, clarity, and helpful guidance to the complex questions arising from the winding down of activities in relation to a situation under investigation and how best to respond. The policies are but one avenue we have used to give further meaning to the Rome Statute's principles of complementarity and cooperation. And we have sought during my term to enhance through a dynamic approach our interactions and relations with partners at the international, 
the regional and the domestic level. It was my plan to also have a policy on modern slavery within the Rome Statute framework finalized before the end of my term, but due to the unfortunate COVID circumstances and with countless priorities and constraints of resources, we could not advance this project in time. The Rome Statute is an important legal tool that must be employed to its full potential to address the heinous crimes that shock the conscience of humanity. And modern slavery is one area where more work is, in my view, warranted. Preliminary examinations was one of the core activities of my office from the time of my predecessor. Through the independent and impartial analysis we conduct, based on various sources available to us, we sought to establish the facts regarding various allegations of Rome Statute crimes that my office receives, and to see whether a criteria is met for my office to open an investigation in a given situation. And we have taken this crucial work with vigor and with complete independence and impartiality across the situations that were under pre preliminary examinations. During my term, we have increased the transparency of our preliminary examination work by engaging with all stakeholders openly and issuing an annual report to provide up-to-date information on the status of different preliminary examinations undertaken by, by the office. In 2020, it is to be recalled that I concluded the preliminary examinations with respect to the situations in UK slash Iraq. In our lengthy report, we explained that despite identifying several overarching concerns at how the UK authorities had conducted relevant investigations, my office was not satisfied that it could demonstrate in the context of Article 18 proceedings before the court that would inevitably ensue that the investigative actions and or prosecutorial decisions taken by the competent domestic authorities evidenced shielding of persons within the meaning of Article 17.2 of the statute. At the same time, we noted several pressing concerns about the pending consideration of domestic legislation that would have created in the UK a statutory presumption against prosecution of current and former service personnel after five years. And I was heartened earlier last year that through the active engagement of voices on all sides, offenses amounting to ICC crimes were ultimately excluded by the UK government from the scope of the proposed legislation. In 2020, we also concluded the Palestine preliminary examination and announced the opening of investigations, having obtained a judicial ruling on the scope of the court's territorial, uh, territorial competence. During 2020, my office also concluded its preliminary examinations into the situations in Nigeria and Ukraine with the determination that the criteria for opening investigations in both situations are met. But as you know, in making my announcement, I stress that due to operational challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic on the one hand, and by the limitations of our operational capacity due to thin and overextended resources on the other, we could not immediately rule out both investigations as we intended to. Indeed, I stress that the court was again confronted with the clear mismatch between the resources afforded to my office and the ever-growing demands placed upon it. Since December 2020, we continued with our, within our means to prepare the plan ahead for potential investigations into both of these situations, including making necessary measures to ensure the integrity of future investigations in advance of lodging the necessary Article 15 applications, and I left both situations on standby for the next stage. It would be, of course, for the incoming prosecutor to take the strategic, the necessary strategic and operational decisions on the prioritization of the office's workload moving forward. With respect to the Philippines, we filed our Article 15 request a month before stepping down, following a lengthy process of planning and preparing and taking measures to preserve a process that had been operationally impacted on the onset in 2019 of COVID-19, but we were in a position to finalize during 2020, just before I left office. With respect to Venezuela 1, 
I had committed to reaching a final determination to the extent possible during the remainder of my term. Perhaps in anticipation of that outcome, as you may have seen reported in the media, the pretrial chamber was seized with a filing by the government of Venezuela requesting the chamber to exercise judicial control over the conduct of our preliminary examination. And these findings were submitted confidentially, so I could not refer to them in detail, although the fact of their submission has been publicly referred to by the Venezuelan themselves. All I could say at the time was that I had in fact reached a final determination on the preliminary examination and that preparing, I had been preparing to announce our conclusion in response to the group states party referral, but that in due deference to the pretrial chamber whose competence I had been seized, I decided to wait for the chamber's determination on Venezuela's request before making any further announcement. All that I could do at that stage was to hand over my determination, which has been completed, together with the basis for it to the incoming prosecutor for his consideration and ultimate decision making. With respect to Colombia, this has been uh, discussed already, as you have seen. We have just issued a promise report, which I committed to publishing before the end of my term. And the report had explained why the situation in Colombia remained under preliminary examination and what remains to be done before the prosecutor reaches a final determination of either to open investigations or to conclude the PE subject to, the, to its reopening upon a change in circumstance. Intensive preliminary examinations was carried out in Guinea, including active engagement and encouragement to the Guinean authorities to conduct their own investigations and prosecutions as they, as they had undertaken to do. I was quite pleased that all efforts that we made, together with my team in the spirit of positive complementarity, came to fruition when domestic proceedings were started in Guinea just last month. And with respect to the remaining preliminary examination, there was Venezuela too and Bolivia. I had also intended, as far as was possible, to reach a determination on at least subject matter jurisdiction during my term. And our simultaneous engagement across multiple situations and our overstretched resources and staff have meant that these two assessments, while they have made significant progress, would also fall to my successor. And finally, during the last term, last six months of my term, my staff has undertaken significant work within available means to advance our assessment on several so-called phase one assessments. The initial filtering assessment as part of the preliminary examination process. And in December of 2020, I announced our hope that during 2021 decisions could be reached either to dismiss or proceed, including with respect to Mexico, Cyprus on the settlements, Yemen, the armed exporters, Cambodia on land grabbing, Syria, Jordan on the deportation issue. And despite the progress on the number of these assessments and made significant progress, I have it's also handed over to the incoming prosecutor to make decisions on them. As I stepped down, preliminary examinations became more integrated into the lifeblood of the office than ever and have become more effective in the taking of advanced measures to ensure the integrity of possible future investigations. And they retain their essential gatekeeper function while at the same time helping to ensure that the court's finite resources are best prioritized, um, ensuring through partnership and vigilance that wherever genuine efforts can be galvanized, that such crimes are investigated and prosecuted first and foremost at the national level, and that the ICC acts only when the primary duty of states has not been realized. Perhaps uh, I see I'm um, running, but, but, but le le let me just try to uh, uh, conclude. I, I believe that the ICC family must continue to dispel honest attacks on deliberate misrepresentations of the court's work and its mandate. It must continue to recall and come together in our resolve that the commission of mass crimes as merely politics 
by other means, will no longer receive a pass, and that perpetrators, irrespective of rank or official status, must answer for their crimes. Because today, what is required is more justice and accountability, not less. The ICC is here to stay and deserves our joint commitments and efforts. I have done my part in my role as prosecutor, and I will continue to advocate for and defend the court's crucial mandate in whatever capacity I am in. I have received a vast number of awards and recognitions, both during my term and until now. And these recognitions I usually state publicly are not singular to me. In fact, they are a recognition of our collective achievements and the impressive work we have been able to accomplish together. They are a tribute first and foremost to my able colleagues at the office I have left and to all those who support the court in one way or the other for their devotion and achievements in the service of the Rome Statute. And these, they sent a very clear message, to me at least, that ultimately and again, irrespective of political posturing, humanity wants the court to succeed. Humanity wants the court to rise above, above the status quo, cultivate the rule of law and speak truth to power and bring the promise of never again and law, not war, closer to reality. They signal to me that our collective efforts must not be in vain and that all value that we hold as important virtues, the goal of advancing the course of international criminal justice with dedication, integrity, and great respect. Respect for the court's important mandate under the statute. Respect for each other as colleagues and as parties and participants in the court's proceedings and activities, first and foremost, and for the victims and the affected communities for which the ICC project was fundamentally created. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you to Klaus, Jennifer, and your team for organizing this prestigious conference celebrating 20 years since the start of the International Criminal Court. It is wonderful to be here with friends, colleagues, and leaders in the international justice sector as we gather to reflect on the challenges and celebrate the accomplishments of the ICC. Amongst its achievements over the past two decades, the court has played an important normative role in delegitimizing the use of armed violence, though clearly the task of universally deterring its use is still before us. The ICC has also played a critical role and challenging the assumption that power is the ultimate guarantor of impunity. But the purpose of the ICC is, of course, much greater than its ability to hold accountable those individuals responsible for international crimes, as important as that function is. And this anniversary is an opportune moment for us to reflect not only on the work and activities of the court, but to also consider the meaning and purpose of this global institution for humanity. According to the preamble of the Rome Statute, the ICC has been entrusted with preserving the delicate mosaic of common bonds that unite people and addressing the threats to the peace, security, and well-being of humanity for the sake of current and future generations. This is a mandate of high order. It is an aspirational narrative we wrote for ourselves in Rome and one we continue to strive towards in creating a more harmonious and more peaceful global community. In my view, the ICC is an important bridge for humanity, helping us to move beyond a collective consciousness of conflict, to move beyond a war consciousness, and to help us move away from our addiction to domination through the use of violence. In some respects, the court is emblematic of both the best and worst of humankind, we have embodied this institution with the highest aspirations for curbing some of, the most, some of the worst human impulses. It is symbolic of a world in transition where both beauty and horror exist. And Nuremberg and this palace were in many ways the beginning of our reckoning with some of those horrors. And I, I would like to pay tribute to those who served the course of justice in the trials held here. As we know, these cases lent heavily and successfully on documentary evidence rather than witness testimony. Nevertheless, I want to honor and, and remember with gratitude
those witnesses who were called to testify, burdened as all victim witnesses are with the experience of harm in the possession of truth and on whose shoulders the pursuit of justice so often relies in courtrooms around the world. In particular, I would like to acknowledge four women witnesses in the doctor's trial held in this room in December 1946. Three of the women, Jadwiga Zido, Maria Brule Platter, and Maria Kuzmiazuk, didn't testify, but rather they were presented as live exhibits for medical experts to point to the scars and wounds on their bodies as evidence of the medical experiments they had been subjected to whilst interned at Ravensbrück concentration camp. Of the four women, only Vladislava Karoluska testified, and in her own voice and with her own words, she described the experience, the harm, the impact of her injuries, and the lasting impairment she lived with. Vladislava was a kindergarten teacher and a civil society activist as a member of the Polish resistance movement. And that civic impulse to raise issues affecting the group, to be a truth teller, and to, and to oppose injustice remained even whilst imprisoned. In her testimony during the trial, Vladislava stated that she and other women in the camp started a petition and gathered signatures to present to the commander informing him of the medical procedures and asserting that as political prisoners, such treatment was prohibited under international law. When I read Vladislava's testimony, I was struck by the courage it must have taken for them to have developed this petition. They were not intimidated into silence by the environment and against tremendous odds, they retained their ability to say, my humanity is not diminished nor extinguished by your failure to see it. The truth upon which Velislava shone her light illuminated not only the horror of her time, it continues to inspire the speaking of truth to horror whenever it occurs and by whomever it is committed. And that is part of the legacy that the ICC inherited and has successfully built upon over the past two decades. And walking right alongside the court and continuing Vladislava's activism, the ICC has been closely accompanied by a dynamic and increasingly diverse civil society. At the start of the court, there wasn't a roadmap for NGOs to follow. No one knew what shape the ICC would take. We didn't know how it would approach implementation of the Rome Statute. We didn't know how quickly its substantive work and strategies would emerge. The stakes were high, expectations were elevated, the innovations of the statute were untested and intoxicating, and this extraordinary endeavour was on the leading edge of global justice and substance process and possibility. Over the years, civil society has proven to be an attentive and enduring partner on this journey. Our roles individually and collectively in holding a mirror to the court a mirror to states' parties, and less frequently to ourselves, is an important one in providing clear-eyed and forthright reflections on the progress of international justice. As one of the co-founders of the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice, I, I know we were keenly aware that what, there wasn't a blueprint for what we could do or how we should do it. There had never been an international women's human rights organization entirely dedicated to advocating with and monitoring the work of a global justice institution, and there had never been a statute with unique and explicit gender justice provisions. We were excited and a little intimidated by the possibilities of the statute, as well as the positive obligation it placed on the ICC to prosecute sexual and gender-based crimes. We knew this would be difficult, because addressing the historical lack of accountability for these crimes would require a change in priorities, practice and approach, but more importantly, it would also require a transformation of legal norms and gender perceptions. It was, it was a daunting task. Now, looking back, it seems that perhaps more has been achieved in this particular area of the ICC's mandate than in any other category of crime within its jurisdiction. Of course, there is much to be done, and hopefully the task is a little less daunting, but there are some highlights along the way, and one I would like to briefly mention is the OTP's groundbreaking policy on sexual and gender-based crimes, the first of its kind that was called for and delivered by Fatou Bensouda within her first two years in office. I had the pleasure of co-developing this policy with the prosecutor's office as her special advisor on gender, and Fatou Bensouda understood, as we did, that this policy was needed because accountability for these acts continued to be exceptional and elusive compared to the scale of their commission. 
and other significant milestones followed, including the judgment and the 2017 Appeals Chamber decision in the Bosco Nutaganda case. These decisions marked one of the most important developments in international humanitarian law in the last 125 years. The conviction of Nutaganda for rape and sexual slavery committed against children within his own militia group and under his command was the first time in history anyone had ever been held accountable for these kinds of crimes. This judgment closed an important and unjustifiable impunity gap, and it extended the legal protections for children within armed militia groups. These decisions and the reasoning underpinning them made a substantive contribution to the kind of visionary jurisprudence we had hoped for from the court and that had been made possible by the Rome Statute. And there are other highlights as well. Vadu has mentioned one, the conviction of Dominic Ong Wing for the widest range of charges for sexual and gender-based crimes ever brought before an international court and the jurisprudence provided by the judgment, particularly with respect to the charge of forced pregnancy, never before litigated as an international crime. The conviction in the Lubanga case for crimes committed against children in armed conflicts, highlighting the vulnerability of children whenever, whenever and wherever war erupts. Of course, the important representation of victims in legal proceedings, the role of defence counsel and, its, and particularly its role um, with respect to the credibility of international criminal law, and of course the implementation of the innovative reparations provisions. and we cannot forget the important amendments to the statute over the last 20 years, and in particular, the addition of the crime of aggression, the most important expansion of the court's jurisdiction since the statute came into force. All of these are significant moments in the development of the court's legacy. In 1998, at the adoption of the Rome Statute, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan referred to this unprecedented treaty and the court it created as a gift of hope for future generations. The preamble of the statute itself is framed in futurist terms with respect to addressing threats to humanity for the sake of current and future generations. And this tilt towards the future is what I would like to focus on now as we think about what comes next for the court and what more and what new do we need to do with respect to the field of international justice. It is clear that we face challenges that can no longer be solved by international, by individual nation states with short-term thinking or relying on existing models of multilateral decision-making. Issues like climate change, loss of ecosystems, economic injustice, violent civil unrest, and armed conflicts both new and entrenched across at least five regions. These and other challenges can't be easily resolved by using a binary digital framework of yes or no, win or lose, for or against, ally or enemy. They can't be solved by tweaking the current decision-making paradigm where only the most powerful determine the outcomes in the future. We are confronted by political and planetary realities that require, and a global citizenry that expects, more effective and more inclusive forms of collective decision-making and a new era of global problem solving. Whereas the model of multilateralism birthed by the UN and its charter was deeply embedded in the preeminent desire to never again return to war, to what do we anchor multilateralism and the practice of collective leadership today, eight decades after its creation, and with the multiplicity of threats to the security, peace, and well-being of humanity? And what does all of this mean for an institution like the ICC and its multilateral leadership? Let me offer some thoughts. With the statutory obligation to be in service to current and future generations, the ASP's governance of the court must become firmly oriented to long-term thinking. Some philosophers refer to this approach as cathedral thinking, bearing in mind the historical timeframes in which the cathedrals were designed and constructed by generations of people who contributed to a building they would never see completed. This challenges us to think about, to think beyond months or a handful of years, to consider much longer time frames, such as several decades at a time or hundreds of years at a time. It also invites us to extend our sense of interest, compassion, and solidarity with those many generations ahead. Of course, this kind of thinking has been understood by indigenous peoples for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. Amongst some Native American nations, the concept is known as seventh generation thinking, which literally means to consider the impact of current decisions on those seven generations ahead who will be inheriting the effects of our choices. 
These ideas require the ASP to shift its temporal perspective, to consider the lasting repercussions of its decisions for the court, and to pay attention to the future of the international justice system. To date, over the past 20 years, the Assembly has not really engaged in any serious planning for the ICC's long-term future. At a practical level, the ASP could begin by dedicating a session on preparing for the future at each of its annual meetings, and it could consider questions like, what should be the priorities for the ASP over the next two to three decades? What more can we do to support the greater fulfilment and future potential of the ICC in the Rome Statute system? What should the court look like in 50 to 100 years? Will the court need to exist in 200 years? And if so, does this suggest failings by us and other generations to end the commission of crimes within the ICC's jurisdiction? How do we ensure the ICC is equipped and able to respond to crises? And what potential current or future threats to the security, peace and well-being of humanity should the ASP be contemplating with respect to the ICC's jurisdiction? And one good example of this, I think, is the issue of ecocide, the mass damage and destruction of the environment. You know, we missed the opportunity 25 years ago to adopt the crime of ecocide within the ICC's jurisdiction in Rome. And as a result, the environment is not protected by international criminal law. And we are seeing the repercussions of that gap now in the form of climate change, reduced biodiversity, marine pollution, and the loss of ecosystems. Put simply, if we're going to use criminal justice at the international level to protect people and stop mass killings and other crimes, shouldn't we also use it to protect the environment and stop mass damage to the natural world and the ecosystems on which all life depends? In many respects, our inclination towards conflict with each other mirrors the conflict we are collectively having with the earth. It's as if we are waging war against nature that is both stealth-like and brazen and for which no one is held accountable. A global campaign is underway proposing an amendment to the statute to include ecocide as the fifth crime against peace. And in my view, ecocide is probably one of the most urgent issues for the ASP to engage with as it takes to heart its responsibility to address threats to the security, peace and well-being of humanity for the sake of current and future generations. In addition to the concept of long-term thinking, I would like to quickly offer two further principles with respect to developing new models of collective decision-making, including the multilateral leadership of the ICC. First, in order to maintain and expand support for the ongoing co-governance of the court, a greater sense of equality amongst states' parties as decision-makers must be achieved. The influence of formal and explicit centres of ICC power, along with the informal and hidden power brokers, has not always fostered a harmonious and transparent governance environment in which every region and all states feel respected and valued. Whereas the current model drains the motivation to collaborate, the principle of equality renews the moral practice of multilateralism. Election along regional lines of state representatives to ASP-related positions ensures the diversity of states' parties is consistently represented. However, this alone does not ensure that the diversity of views are heard, that historic and ongoing power imbalances are corrected, nor that the ASP benefits from all of the wisdom its members have to offer. Diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice, and this has to become the normative model of decision-making, ensuring that all states' parties can genuinely shape and select agendas, decide on the priorities, and mutually influence the outcomes. Such a model, provides the space for the creation of solutions that are new in kind and more durable by degree. And for this model to succeed, the skills of deep listening and the high art form of conflict resolution and mediation tools will be needed. Lastly, moving forward, states, parties and civil society have a non-waivable duty of care for the ICC and for the fulfillment of its purpose. States parties are not relieved of their guardianship of the Rome Statute and the ICC by embedding sole responsibility for its success and blame for its shortfalls with the staff and leadership of the court. The insightful independent re expert review conducted in 2020 documented a number of concerning institutional findings and provided detailed and helpful recommendations. 
To be honest, many of the issues were not a surprise to civil society actors. A few of us had been raising concerns regarding institutional integrity and organisational ethics for several years prior to the review. Although the expert report is primarily focused on the ICC, in my view, the subtext of the report reveals the limitations of good intentions by states' parties when those intentions are not coupled with principled and effective governance practices. As we know, good intentions are never enough. And whether deliberate or not, this approach guarantees that the institution will never become more powerful than the political forces that created it. Without effective governance, states' parties are at risk of glorifying the existence of the court while simultaneously neutering the power of its mandate. A new era of collective decision-making and leadership is needed, and the ASP could be the body to spearhead this process not only for the ICC, but as an exemplar of the practice of multilateralism renewed by the principle of equality and committed to long-term thinking. Someone needs to lead the development of new models of decision-making for a new era of problem-solving. Why couldn't this be the ASP in collaboration with the court and civil society? In fact, who is better placed than this community to do so? The preamble of the statute justifies this role. Political and planetary realities require it. And as a sector, we've done this before, creating a court and a new system out of ideas and possibilities. It is time for us to step into becoming the version of ourselves we wrote about in Rome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank our keynote speakers for their thoughtful remarks. And we have about half an hour for discussion. So if perhaps I could pose a question or two drawing on what you have said, uh, maybe that would uh, get the ball rolling and, and see where that goes. Um, one thing that came to mind when we were talking about new models was this idea that has arisen um, with uh, the Ukraine investigation and the joint investigative team that um, uh, the Genocide Network Secretariat has helped to form. So not only do you have multiple referrals to the ICC, but you have a kind of coordination between multiple national prosecution services and the ICC Office of the Prosecutor is participating in that network as well. And I wonder what that kind of coordination what does that mean for the, the model that Prosecutor Ocampo was talking about? The success of the ICC ultimately is when there are no cases because they're being handled by the national level. But this model posits almost something in between. It's not all or nothing, but in fact a meeting in the middle of these actors with their resources in an attempt to coordinate to address a, a bigger threat than they can each handle on their own. So we had in our spring conference where we discussed whether the future of international criminal law is domestic, we had this outstanding question of how do you actually coordinate among so many cooks in the kitchen, among so many actors. And I wondered if anyone here would care to comment on that idea. Uh, I would have to respect Prosecutor Karim Khan's role, but the system was developed at Rome, it's called complementarity. So meaning, it's great that he's making effort, but if the national systems are working, it's fine. The issue is for me, the case the national system cannot do is against President Putin himself. Because President Putin has immunity before national courts. So the issue is what kind, and it's no aggression crime. So. I don't think President Putin was involved in bombing the hospitals. So the issue is what type of case can the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court do that other prosecutors cannot do? So that should be the focus, no? The rest is basically, I don't think you need the middle. The, the, the system is clear. And in fact, the Ukrainian prosecutor is active also. The chief prosecutor ICC was supporting her. So the system is there. But the issue is what case could be done against President Putin himself? Um, perhaps to add to that, and then I'll hand you the floor. Um, perhaps it goes to the question of the, say, the width or depth of the impunity gap. 
Um, if the ICC can only do a certain number of cases and national prosecutors, um, I believe we had that discussion on Libya, national prosecutors may feel constrained in how many cases they can do. Is it better in that case to have multiple actors each taking a bite at that apple, each trying to reduce the number of cases or coordinating so that more cases are done? And does that actually, as you say, reflect on the original mandate of complementarity or does that muddy the waters in any way? One of the underlying things that we've all, always said um, uh, is that there should not be an op the option of impunity. Uh, we, we have to uh, continue to try to look for ways in which um, these crimes can be addressed by one institution or another. I, I think if we talk about uh, complementarity, we, we're really trying to make sure that that gap is filled that impunity gap is filled. And uh, uh, depending on the times, various methods can be used. Look at what is happening today uh, with Ukraine and having all these initiatives that are being taken to, uh, to ensure that there will be accountability to, for the crimes that are, that are, that are being committed. Um, with respect to having too many cooks in the, in the kitchen, I think that also is something that has to be looked at very, very carefully because there are issues of witness fatigue, for instance, um, because these crimes, they cut across, and you may find one uh, witness having to be used in various other courts. Uh, but I wanted to say something with respect to the, um, what is happening right now in Ukraine. It is horrible, and it shouldn't happen. But what I have noted, um, is that uh, the international community has given a lot of attention to Ukraine at the um, unfortunate neglect of others. And I'm saying this having first-hand experience with respect to, I was, as you, you know, elected as the chairperson for the Commission on Ethiopia, Tigray. And that commission, I remember, eventually I have resigned from the commission because I, I, I went to work for my government. But we were struggling in the commission just to get the basic resources to be allocated with the basic resources to be able to do its work. Um, and, and at the same time, we were there sitting and looking at these other commissions that are being created, being you know, heaped with, with resources and whatever they wanted. I think that is uh, really something that the international community has to look into very, very, very carefully. If we are saying that we want to avoid the double standards, these are one of the things that we need to um, pay attention to. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, that uh, um, we, we have to do something with Ukraine. It's, a, it's really uh, very, very serious but not at the detriment also of others. Ambassador, would you like to add something? Yeah, I really want to second uh, Fatou on that. I think it's a very, very important point. Uh, the ICC is not a, not a court for Ukraine. It's not a court for, it's not a court for Europe. And, you know, we very strongly support the efforts of the ICC to prosecute and investigate in in Ukraine, we have also very deliberately not given any resources for that investigation because we think the resources should go to the entirety of the court's activities. And we have for years and years, um, you know, been faced with the dynamic in the budget discussions where some of the states that are throwing money at the court right now, quite frankly, um, have uh, been extremely conservative with respect to financing of investigations and we think that's wrong um, and you know in in this crisis there is also an opportunity and the opportunity certainly for us the states is to say we have to equip this court with the resources that it requires uh, and really respecting its independence not to say we want you to investigate ukraine but we want to give you the money that you need to do your work and I think that should be that should be the message and one of the lessons learned. We are super happy to see, you know, we, we helped we, we did refer the situation in Ukraine to the others, but that should not be a, a unique response. You know, that should also happen 
That should also in other ha happen in other cases and in, uh, and in other contexts. As far as, you know, I'm not the prosecutor here. We have two prosecutors here, so I'm a bit reluctant to talk about this. But what I can tell you from, you know, the vantage point of my job is that there is a lot of talk about coordination of the coordination and that everybody now is being very active on Ukraine and where that will end up, I really don't know. Um, I hope it will end up in an extremely good place and that we have effective prosecutions and investigations, but people who know much more about this than I do also ask questions about that. So I think we'll have to take a, a look at this, a very honest look at this, and also learn the best lessons from that for the future and see how we can uh, best, you know, repeat or otherwise adjust that for future cases. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, if I may uh, pivot a little bit, I wanted to draw on something that Bridget said about cathedral thinking, um, which I think was a really important point. Um, the idea that came to my mind was what I would call big tent thinking. And this is something that I learned from Bill Pace, uh, working at the beginning of my career with the coalition and seeing the dynamic of um, creating a space where many diverse actors could come together. And not only did it breed really um, essential ideas about how the system would function, but it brought the people as well together who worked through friendship and through these very strong bonds of commitment, not just intellectually, intellectually but to each other in a way, that sense of community. Um, I think as the ICC is entering now the phase of this third prosecutor, um, I know from talking to Bill and some of the other NGO leaders that NGOs are confronting this question now of their role and how to sustain it. Um, I spent enough time around the Security Council to see how the diplomats had to work so carefully to pass the mantle of leadership to the next group, to the next uh, um, diplomats who were inhabiting the council for two years or four years to try to keep that momentum going. And I wonder if in this discussion around reform at the ICC, if it doesn't have to be broader, and how do we foster that sort of big tent thinking again to, to keep people connected into this process and to try to create space to envision where the court would be in 20 years or 40 years or 100 years. If there's um, anything anyone would like to add on that. Well, um, thank you for that question and thank you for mentioning the, the coalition and the incredible work of the CACC. Um, and Bill, your leadership and, and the leadership around you and, and those who've continued has been incredibly important in bringing together a diverse range of voices and then new networks, new alliances, new coalitions have emerged as we would expect. Um, and you know, new leaders will emerge with their own sense of direction and priorities um, that may differ from the ones we thought were important at the time or were important at the time. And that's a natural process of, of evolution and of change. Um, and that one of the things that I'm often reminded um, of is that, you know, change is, is in progress, is not linear. We will go forward several steps and then back a couple and then um, sometimes the adversity and the challenges um, are really an opportunity for us to renew and rethink our approaches. Um, certainly, I know funding in the civil society sector in this particular field has become more difficult um, and that creates significant challenges, but there are also perhaps um, it challenges us to think more creatively and to try new approaches, to create new alliances. Um, one of the opportunities I see in relation to big tent thinking is for our community, the international justice community, to be engaged more closely with other communities. I think we have more to offer than when we are, we're only speaking to ourselves. So I think we should be speaking with other communities, engaging in the, in the COP processes, engaging with the um, uh, economic processes and discussions and debates. I think we have a lot to add to that conversation, particularly because um, those issues are drivers of the kinds of crimes and acts that end up before the ICC or have the potential to. Would anyone else like to, to comment? Actually, uh, perhaps then I could um, ask Prosecutor Ocampo, since you raised the question of art and law and the importance of reflecting on these issues outside of legal environments, through arts, through film, and so forth. What is it that um, 
legal practitioners can do to embrace that broader way of thinking? Or what is, you know, how can artists engage with this process? How can we create the space for that, that dialogue to, to go on? I suppose we'll talk about that, but I feel it is not just what the court is doing. The court has to do with job and is doing the job. The issue is, for instance, in my time, Invisible Children, a group of young kids from San Diego made an incredible film reaching 120 million viewers in six days. No one can do that. So no, no one can do that inside the court. You need people from outside making information about that. So for me, people from like me, outside the court, we are not working on the court. We can help to reach other people to, to come to us. It's not about what the judges can do. Judges cannot do films or songs. Artists should do it. So we need to find a way to attract them. Maybe Ben Avester had to go to Hollywood and invite people. The court itself. Mm. The, the court cannot reach everyone. It's impossible. So we need to mm. attract other constituencies. And Brigitte explained difficulties that you have Now, OK, we have to find. Mm. That, for me, it, the job is not so much about what the judge will do it. They, they, they should do something, whatever. But people outside the court who, who help to attract more people to to focus on how to support peace and justice and not war. Okay. Um, perhaps, go ahead. Um, just, just to um, uh, take up on this point of uh, people outside of the court having a role uh, to play and having, uh, looking for ways to support the work of the court. Um, I, I think I have at several engagements said that I believe that the states parties should uh, also talk amongst themselves and see uh, in whatever other ways that they can support the work of the court to make it known, but also even help to make it more um, acceptable if, if that is possible. And I recall um, the, the morning breakfast that we have uh, had that Christ, uh, Christian used to organize every time we went to report to the UN Security Council. I found those to be very, very helpful, very useful, because I know that many people would learn new things about what the office, of doing, what, what the office was doing, which ordinarily they probably would not have known what the, what the court is doing. And this was very, very uh, helpful. I also remember that uh, this propaganda that was made against the court, that the um, ICC is just going after Africans, uh, this was a machinery that was created against the court with experience, propaganda, and, and, and uh, uh, corporations who really just got out to make sure that this, this uh, um, accusation or this criticism, people believed in it. And probably at the very beginning, we were saying that obviously, I mean, look at the facts. How can you look at the facts and say that this is what ICC is doing? But unfortunately, those facts, people did not know. So what these people, uh, what these others uh, intended to do actually could hold water. And people started really believing the ICC was set up as a Western court to try African leaders. And you, I don't need to go into what has happened after that, really. All, all hell broke loose. And then we had to run after ourselves to try and uh, um, explain that really this is, this is not the case. For us, it was so obvious that it was not the case. But then, at the same time, this other um, criticism and propaganda really gained ground. And it led to even the African leaders threatening to leave the ICC. You, you, you saw what happened in 2016, 2017. So those are, those are really issues that um, states parties do not have to wait for the court even to request that of them. They, they do not have to wait. They, I think working very closely with the court, they can consistently be discussing and anticipating you know, some of these challenges that uh, the court is likely to face, especially the office also is likely to face, and to see what to do to avert those, those challenges. Well, I was trying to recall, and Prosecutor Ocampo, perhaps you remember the name of that Kenyan TV show? XYZ, XYZ yeah. And this was, uh, there was a, a 
TV show in Kenya with puppets. Mm -hmm. And yeah. actually, um, in the course of the Kenyan investigation through several seasons, addressed in some detail the investigation. Um, uh, the prosecutor was a character. Even uh, Judge Trendafilova, I think, was a character. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a program that really actually did disseminate at a cultural, at a broader level, some discussion about about what was happening with the ICC. Do you feel like that contributed to greater understanding of the ICC in Kenya? Do you think it had a, right, a wider reach? It was, yes. Mm. Yes, Not, yes, I mm. think that, that show was very popular in Kenya. Mm. But the, the show, show, maybe in the next, uh, first, I think what you are doing now is the type of things we, we need to do for the ICC. You convey all these people we are invited here to discuss between us. That is very helpful. Maybe we need a panel about musicians and, and filmmakers to add, no? to understand, because they have different thinking, and we need to understand them. Mm. So I think, but I would suggest what you are doing here is, mm. is an initiative taken by you and Klaus and the Academy to push for this. We need to keep doing that, but maybe including other groups in this conversation, not just mm -hmm. lawyers or experts, also people who understand communication. Uh, but Prosecutor Bensuda, is there any show or media or anything you would have thought if they had taken up this question in a cultural context about ICC unfairly targeting Africa, that that could have swayed or moved the needle a little bit? It was a very broad question. It was a political campaign, of course. It was a very difficult thing to tackle. But do you think something could come to mind that you think if someone had covered it or talked about it from a cultural perspective, it could have had an impact? Yeah, I mean, I always believe that uh, reaching out to the that I always believe that reaching out to, to the grassroots, reaching out to people, you know, the ordinary people of society to explain uh, certain things, important things that are happening uh, is very, very important. And I know that it has been used severally, at least in the Gambia. Um, and even the other time I was with uh, a colleague who said that it was very lightly used uh, in, in that context in Ghana to spread some information by using films, by going out, mm -hmm. making screens and explaining to people. And that, that project was very, very successful because of what was done. So that reaching out to, the, to the, um, those members of our society who need to understand uh, what really this is, is going on by using media, by using films, uh, mm -hmm. could, could be very helpful. Because what we see today is that, uh, of Unfortunately, there is the phenomenon of fake news. And um, those people who, who choose to, to, to use it, use it to the detriment of really very, very important projects that are going on. Or maybe people who are trying to make a difference or make a change, unfortunately, they, they, they are featured in a way that would even destroy the, the, um, the steps that they are taking mm. to, to, to do good. So for, for, to have the counter narrative also, but in an effective way that could reach as many people as possible, I mm. think this is, this is important. Okay. No, in, I mean, in, in, in my experience, the, I think there's a lot of people that are really drawn to the ICC instinctively because people have mm. a, sort of an innate reaction to justice and people crave justice. And uh, and, and this, I think this is a big, big plus for the ICC. At the same time, there are not that many people who understand the ICC, quite frankly. Yeah. And that's also, you know, what I said in my speech, you have to explain it to policymakers, you know, talk to parliamentarians, and unless they are, you know, members of David, David's uh, platform, and are members of parliamentarians of global action, I mean, they have no idea. And then, of course, you can dumb it down and you can explain the basics and then it gets hard when people say yeah but then why are you not prosecuting putin or assad or and and who is the guy that he did prosecute so and your policy is to go after the worst people and then you end up with these so and and then it, that's when it becomes difficult mm -hmm. and then you lose some people honestly in the conversation some people say okay well, i guess it's not for me because i don't get it 
because you want to go after the, the most serious perpetrators and you're not doing it. So, but there's a lot of people that you don't lose. And if you, if you keep going in that direction, uh, you know, then I think you actually find advocates and you find people that, uh, um, that work for you. But it's, a, it's not an easy conversation to have. Um, quite frankly, and you know, for me then to talk to people about, yeah, this is how it works with aggression. So, you know, if Costa Rica attacks Liechtenstein, there is jurisdiction. If Russia attacks Ukraine, there is no jurisdiction. And everybody's like, mm, okay, that's really great law. So, you know, there are difficulties, and there are difficulties with, uh, with universality. And, um, you know, you have to be very persistent, in and I think you have to be in a way a bit also courageous, you know, to first of all really simplify things, but you also say, yeah, look, there are parts of the system that are clearly imperfect, and that's, that's the way it is. Hey, because Bill Pace was worried about the war situation, and everyone is worried about the war situation, and I think Christian just mentioned the ambassadors are complicated to explain, except they receive instructions. Ambassador receive instructions. So if the political leader gave instructions, so Paul as you see do what the university is proposing, they will do it. So but political leaders need people demand. And that's why I believe the challenge in the future is not just technical expert opinion, also how we get people demand for justice. And I believe the new generations are ready. We need to help them to do the demands. Then political leader will take into consideration, and then we give instruction to the ambassadors, and then the ambassador will support. So it's a sequence. Uh, but, but maybe as, as Bridget was saying, and maybe to close out this discussion, you have to be able to envision the court of the future and believe that court that can prosecute all those responsible does exist in some form in the future, that it is worth planning towards and worth fighting for, in spite of the obstacles we see now and in spite of all the difficulties it has encountered, um, we have to plan for it if we want it, but first we have to believe that it can exist and we have to perhaps, as Judge Pillay say, renew our commitment or renew our faith to that idea that it's something that can be and that is worth planning for and fighting for. So, all right. Thank you. With uh, 29 seconds, I think we can wrap up this discussion. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation. I think it's been a wonderful start to this three days. Um, if we can, um, Alex, wherever you are, <laughs> we will demonstrate the use of Slido um, to ensure that everyone is comfortable with it. So my colleagues will post the practice motion on the screen in a short while, in a moment or so. Um, as I mentioned, there is a QR code on the last page of the brochure in the middle of the brochure. And if you uh, care to participate and you'd like to scan it with your phone, then in a moment, the poll, the practice question will appear under polls. So, and there it is. Um, does everyone see it? Are you scanning? Yes, there it is. So, if you were to scan the QR code under polls, this question would appear, and you can choose agree or disagree and hit send. It's really, it's obviously, it's not a super scientific poll. It's just to get a snapshot of a question that cuts a little bit directly to the point of what we're trying to discuss. Um, not definitive, um, but uh, yes, if you like, you can send in. And then in a minute, we will uh, put the summary or put the result. Um, just so you know as well, um, in addition to the QR code, you can go to slido.com and enter the event code, which is 3653103. If you do that, it goes immediately to this page. So if you've got your laptop, but your phone is not uh, a phone of the future and doesn't feel like participating, you can also go in on your laptop. <laughs> we, have, we know how that goes. So you can go to slido.com on your laptop and enter the event code 3653103. Okay. Well, uh, shall we close the polls now? and show the results on the screen when you're ready. There you go. 81% agree <laughs> the ICC is success. 19% disagree. All right. Well, that's just a little taste of what we'll be doing. Thank you for your participation in this practice motion.
<laughs> if you have any questions about Slido, don't hesitate to come up and ask. And we look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow morning for the first full day of this Nuremberg Forum, the International Criminal Court 2002 to 2022, a court in practice. Uh, for speakers, of course, you have the information about uh, the dinner in your logistical packet. So we look forward to seeing some of you there. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. See you tomorrow.